Purgatory, Chapter 15 The Pains of Purgatory St. Magdalene de Pazzi, in her celebrated vision, where the different prisons of purgatory were shown to her, saw the soul of her brother, who died after having led a most fervent Christian life. Nevertheless, this soul was detained in suffering for certain faults, which had not sufficiently expiated upon earth. These, says the saint, are the most intolerable sufferings, and yet they are endured with joy. Ah, uh, why are they not understood by those who lack the courage to bear their cross here below? Struck with this frightful spectacle which had just been contemplated, she ran to her prioress, and casting herself upon her knees, she cried out, My dear mother, how terrible are the pangs of purgatory! Never could I have believed it, had not God manifested it to me. And nevertheless, I cannot call them cruel. Rather, they are advantageous, since they lead to the ineffable bliss of paradise. To impress this more and more upon our minds, it has pleased God to give us certain holy persons a small share in the pains of expiation, like a drop of the bitter cup which the poor souls have to drink a spark of the fire which consumes them. The historian Bozovas, in his History of Poland, under the date 1598, relates a miraculous event, which happened to the venerable Stanislaus Koczka, one of the luminaries of the Order of St. Dominic in Poland. One day, whilst this religious, full of charity for the departed, recited the rosary, he saw appear near him a soul all enveloped in flames. As she besought him to have pity on her, and to alleviate the intolerable sufferings which the fire of divine justice caused her to endure, the holy man asked her if the fire was more painful than that of earth. Ah, she cried, all the fires of earth compared to that of purgatory are like a refreshing breeze. Stanislaus could scarcely believe it. I wish, he said, I have a proof, if God will permit, for your relief and for the good of my soul. I consent to suffer a part of your pains. Alas, you could not do this. Know that no human being could endure such torment and live. However, God will permit you to feel it in a light degree. Stretch forth your hand. Shkochka extend his hand, and the departed let fall a drop of sweat, or at least of a liquid which resembled it. At the same instant the religious uttered a piercing cry and fell fainting to the ground. So frightful and tense was the pain. His brethren ran to the spot and hastened to give him his assistance, which his condition required. When restored to consciousness, he related the terrible event which had occurred, and of which he had a visible proof. Ah, my dear fathers, he continued, if we knew the severity of the divine chastisements, we should never commit sin, nor should we cease to do penance in this life, in order to avoid expiation in the next. Stanislaus was confided to the bed from that moment. He lived one year longer in the most cruel sufferings caused by this terrible wound. Then, for the last time, exhorting his brethren to remember the rigors of divine justice, he peacefully slept in the Lord. The historian adds that this example reanimated fervor in all the monasteries of the Providence. Read a similar fact in the life of the blessed Catherine de Ricogini. One day, when she suffered so intensely as to need the assistance of her sisters in religion, she thought of the souls in purgatory, and to temper the heat of their flames, she offered to God the burning heat of her fervor. At that moment, being wrapped in ecstasy, she was conducted in spirit to the place of expiation, where she saw the flames and braziers in which the souls are purified in great torture. Whilst contemplating, full of compassion, this piteous spectacle, she heard a voice which said to her, Catherine, 
in order that you may procure most efficaciously the deliverance of these souls, you shall participate, in some manner, in their torments. At the same moment, a spark detached itself from the fire and settled upon her left cheek. The sisters present saw the spark distinctly, and saw it also with horror that the face of the sick person was frightfully swollen. She lived several days in this state, and, as Blessed Catherine told her sisters, the sufferings caused by that simple spark far surpassed all she had previously endured in the most painful maladies. Until that time, Catherine had always devoted herself with charity to the relief of the souls in purgatory, but from thenceforward she redoubled her fervor and austerities to hasten their deliverance because she knew by experience the great need in which they stood of her assistance. Purgatory Chapter 16 The Pains of Purgatory That which shows us still more the rigor of purgatory is the shortest period of time which appears to be very long duration. Everyone knows that the day of enjoyment passes quickly and appears short, while the time passed in suffering we find very long. Oh, how slowly passes the hours of the night for the poor sick, who spend them in sleeplessness and pain. We may say that the more intense the pain, the longer appears the shortest duration of time. This rule furnishes us with a new means of estimating the sufferings of purgatory. We find in the annals of the Friar Miners under the year 1285, a fact which is also related by St. Antonius in his Summa, a religious man suffering for a long time from a painful malady had allowed himself to be overcome by discouragement and entreated God to permit him to die, that he might be released from his pains. He did not think that the prolongation of his sickness was a mercy of God, who wished to spare him more severe sufferings. In answer to his prayers, God charged his angel guardian to offer to him his choice, either to die immediately and submit to the pains of purgatory for three days, or to bear his sickness for another year and then go directly to heaven. The sick man, having to choose between the three days in purgatory and one year in suffering upon earth, did not hesitate, but took the three days in purgatory. After the lapse of an hour, his angel went and visited him in his sufferings. On seeing him, the poor patient complained that he had been left so long in those torments, and yet, he added, you promised that I should remain but only three days. How long, asked the angel, do you think that you have been suffering? At least for several years, he replied, and I had to suffer but three days. No, said the angel, that you have been here only one hour. The intensity of the pain deceives you as to the time. It makes an instant appear as a day, and an hour years. Alas, then, he said with a sigh, I have been very blind and inconsiderate in the choice I made. Pray God, my good angel, to pardon me, and permit me to return to earth. I am ready to submit to the most cruel maladies, not only for two years, but as long as it shall please him. Rather six years of horrible suffering than one single hour in the abyss of unutterable agonies. The following is taken from a pious author quoted by Father Rosangali. Two religious of eminent virtue vied with each other in leading a holy life. One of them fell sick and learned in a vision that he should soon die, that he should be saved, and that he should remain in purgatory only until the first mass should be celebrated for the repose of his soul. Full of joy at these tidings, he hastened to impart them to his friend, and entreated him not to delay the celebration of the Mass, which was to open heaven to him. He died the following morning, and his holy companion lost no time in celebrating the holy sacrifice. After Mass, whilst he was making his thanksgiving, he still continued to pray for his departed friend. 
The latter appeared to him radiant with glory, but in a tone sweetly plaintive, and asked why that that mass of which he stood in need had been so long delayed. My blessed brother, replied the religious, I delayed so long, you say? I do not understand you. What? Did you not leave me to suffer for more than a year before offering a mass for the repose of my soul? Indeed, my dear brother, I commenced mass immediately after your death. Not a quarter of an hour had elapsed. Then regarding him with emotion, the blessed soul cried out, How terrible are those expiatory pains, since they have caused me to mistake minutes for a year. Serve God, my dear brother, with an exact fidelity, in order that you may avoid those chastisements. Farewell, I fly to heaven, where you will soon join me. This severity of divine justice in regard to the most fervent souls is explained by the infinite sanctity of God, who discovers stains in that which appears to be most pure. The annals of the Order of St. Francis speak of a religious whose eminent sanctity had caused him to be surnamed Angelicus. He died in odor of sanctity at the monastery of the Friars Minor in Paris, and one of his brethren in religion, a doctor in theology, persuaded that, after a life so perfect, he had gone directly to heaven, and that he stood in no need of prayers, omitted to celebrate for him the three masses of obligation, which, according to the custom of the Institute, were offered for each departed member. After a few days, whilst he was walking and meditating in a retired spot, the deceased appeared before him enveloped in flames, and said to him in a mournful voice, Dear Master, I beg of you, have pity on me. What, Brother Angelicus, do you need my assistance? I am detained in fires of purgatory, awaiting the fruit of the holy sacrifice which you should have offered three times for me. Beloved brother, I thought you were already in possession of the eternal glory. After a life so fervent and exemplary as yours had been, I could not imagine that there remained any pain to be suffered. Alas, alas, replied the departed, no one can believe with what severity God judges and punishes his creatures. His infinite sanctity discovers in our best actions defective spots, imperfections which displease him. He requires of us an account even to the last farthing. Purgatory, Chapter 17 Pains of Purgatory Blessed Quinziani, the Emperor Maurice In the life of Blessed Stafina Quinziani, a Dominican nun, mention is made of a sister named Paula, who died at the convent of Mantua, after a long life of eminent virtue. The body was carried to the church and placed uncovered in the choir among the religious. During the recitation of the office, Blessed Quinziani knelt near the bier, recommending to God the deceased religious, who had been very dear to her. Suddenly the latter let fall the crucifix which had been placed between her hands, extended her left arm, seized the right hand of the Blessed Quinziani, impressed it tightly as a poor patient in the burning heat of fervor, would ask the assistance of a friend. She held it for a considerable time and then, withdrawing her arm, sank back lifeless into the coffin. The religious astonished at this prodigy asked an explanation of the Blessed Sister. She replied that, whilst the deceased pressed her hand, an inarticulate voice had spoken in the depths of her heart, saying, Help me, dear sister, succor me in the frightful torture which I now endure. Oh, if you knew the severity of the judge who desires all our love, what atonement he demands for the least faults before admitting us to the reward. If you knew how pure we must be to see the face of God, pray, pray and do penance for me, who can no longer help myself. 
Blessed Quinziani, touched by the prayer of her friend, imposed upon herself all kinds of penances and good works, until she learned, by a new revelation, that Sister Paula was delivered from her sufferings, and had entered into eternal glory. The natural conclusion which follows from these terrible manifestations of divine justice is that we must hasten to make satisfaction for our sins in this life. Surely a criminal condemned to be burned alive would not refuse a lighter pain, if the choice were left to him. Suppose it would be said to him, You can deliver yourself from that terrible punishment on conclusion that the three days you fast on bread and water. Should he refuse it? He who should prefer the torture of fire to that of a light penance, would he not be regarded as one who has lost his reason? Now, to prefer the fire of purgatory to Christian penance is an infinite greater folly. The Emperor Maurice understood this and acted wisely. History relates that this prince, notwithstanding his good qualities, which had endeared him to St. Gregory the Great, towards the close of his reign committed a grave fault and atoned it by an exemplary repentance. Having lost a battle against the Khan, or King of the Avari, he refused to pay the ransom of the prisoners, although he was asked but the sixth part of a gold coin, which is less than a dollar of our own money. This mean refusal put the barbarous conqueror into such a violent rage that he ordered the immediate massacre of all the Roman soldiers, to the number of twelve thousand. Then the emperor acknowledged his fault, and felt it so keenly that he sent money and candles to the principal churches and monasteries to beg that God would be pleased to punish him in this life rather than in the next. These prayers were heard, and the year 602, wishing to oblige his troops to pass the winter in the opposite banks of the Danube, a mutiny arose among them. They drove away their general and proclaimed as emperor Pushkas, a simple centurion. The imperial city followed the example of the army. Maurice was obliged to fly in the night. After having divested himself of all the marks of royalty, which now served but to increase his fears, nevertheless he was recognized. He was taken together with his wife, five of his sons, and three daughters. That is to say, his entire family, with the exception of his eldest son, whom he had already caused to be crowned emperor, and who, thus far, had escaped the tyrant. Maurice and his five sons were unmercifully slaughtered near the Celtidon. The carnage began with the youngest of the princes, who was put to death before the eyes of the unfortunate father, without uttering a word of complaint. Remembering the pains of the other world, he esteemed himself happy to suffer in the present life, and throughout the massacre he spoke no other words than those of the psalmist. Thou art just, O Lord, and thy judgment is right.